Matthew chapter 4, beginning at verse 8, says, Again, the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. Now our text today begins with this phrase, again the devil. Last week it was then the devil, the week before then the devil. We see these patterns begin to emerge in this series of temptations that Jesus experiences. And one of the things that is important in our life is for us to actually see the patterns that continue to repeat themselves around us. All of us have certain triggers. And in that way, when something happens around us, there's a typical way that we behave. Sometimes that is, that's a good thing. We behave properly, and in that proper behavior, then there's usually a good reward that follows. But for some of us, there is a, a behavior that is not the most beneficial. We get frustrated, we get stressed out, we then act out, or we say things, or we do things that end up being destructive. And then we find ourselves going from this pattern of trigger to destruction to cleaning it all up, back to trigger to destruction to cleaning it all up, right? Like this is just a pattern that we see in our lives. We live by these certain axioms that are even existing outside of the gospel. We say things like, the one who refuses to learn from history is doomed to repeat it. The only predictor of future success is past behavior, right? We have these patterns that we all tend to sort of live by. And in this text, we continue to see a pattern unfolding. Jesus did not go through these temptations to just prove that he was God. He went through these temptations to demonstrate for us what is the best way to behave when we are being tempted by the enemy. Because when he left us and he ascended on high and he left salvation for us and he gave us the spirit of God, we then have the capacity to do what he did, reflect his behavior. Now sometimes in my life, I find myself more reflecting my own wants, my own desires, my own behaviors, and I'm sometimes ignorant of his. I, I know how he behaved. I know how I'm supposed to behave. But sometimes, man, the team just loses. They lose. And when they lose, like rather than just being okay, I will tear up my family room. Pillows will go everywhere. I'll bend over. I will just punch things. Last Sunday night? Oh, you don't know. I am literally just destroying my own sofa. Bah, 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 bah. So it's a stupid game. I hate football. It, it's a pattern. It's a pattern that has been there since I was in the second grade. At the end, everything hurts. Why does everything hurt? Because I'm, I'm, I'm so mad over a football game. Now, thankfully, that's one of those things that really doesn't maybe matter as much to the world on the outside. But what are those triggers in our lives that cause us to just make a mess that now we've got to clean up? And we see here this pattern of Jesus not making a mess that he has to clean up, but rather Jesus doing what is possible for us to do so that we just live in a place of victory. So that we just live in a place of overcoming and we see it all begin to form around us. And here's probably what is the most beautiful pattern 
that we see in this entire series of temptations that we're going to get to at the back end, but I just want to lay it out there to start. What happened in the end? Satan left, and the angels came and ministered to Jesus. When you know that no matter what the temptation, that when you overcome, the enemy leaves, and the refreshing from the presence of God comes, you will be willing to endure whatever is thrown out because you know the victory has a reward that is far greater than the temptation that you're dealing with. When we know that's the end, there's a different behavior in the beginning. See, this is what Jesus knew 100%. This is what he knew. Psalm chapter 37 and verse 14, it says it like this. That when the righteous cry, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. For many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Yes. Here's the pattern. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. That's the pattern. There's no living so good that you actually get to live outside of the temptation. I know some people like to think that, like, oh, man, like, I've got Christianity down so well, I'm not even tempted. I live outside of the temptation. That's garbage. It's absolute garbage. The problem is we get in a place where the, first, the minimal temptations, we learn to do to live outside of those because we've conquered them. Now we've stepped into a whole new line of temptations that we're not even aware are going on. One, one thing I've noticed about people who have been following God longer than new people is they, they have things conquered like maybe how they talk. Maybe they don't say what this guy says. Good for you. Maybe, maybe they don't drink what this guy drinks. Good for you. Maybe they're not smoking, vaping what this guy's smoking. Good, awesome. But you get to this level, and these are the, some of the most gossiping, complaining, unforgiving, rude people you'll ever meet in your life. Like, awesome, you didn't swear when you smashed your finger with a hammer, great. But what about this? Like, if we don't recognize the temptation, here's the thing, we'll never conquer it. You should be able to tell me what your temptations are right now at the place where you are in life. We should know what they are. Why? Because if I don't know what they are, I have no idea how to conquer them. I have no idea when they show up. Because there was a pattern of temptation that literally moved. And Satan went straight to the one at the end that he was trying to get Jesus to do all along. You think the little temptations are to trip you up? They're just to keep you from the big one. No, like for real. We should know where we are. What is tempting me today? Where's my struggle today? Where am I having to follow God today? Do you recognize where the enemy's coming? Because many are the afflictions. It's not going to be a few. Many are the afflictions of the who? Of the righteous. And here's the other thing we see. When the righteous cry for help, not, not just when the, the guy that really isn't following God cries for help, when the righteous cry for help. That means I'm following him. I'm obeying his word for my life. Like I have made the gospel prime supreme. I've made it central to everything that I do. The righteous. Why am I, why is a righteous person crying for help? Because many are the afflictions of the righteous. It's not going away, it's not stopping, it just evolves and it changes. It moves from one temptation to another. Where is the temptation today? And are you crying for help? Or do you not even recognize it? So I wanna, I wanna recognize what's coming against me. And the thing is, we talk like this, like, man, that sounds almost like depressing. You, especially those of us that come from strong faith backgrounds, like, what, what do you mean, many? I'm the overcomer. I'm blessed coming in. I'm blessed going out. I'm nothing. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. And, and here's what James tells us, James chapter 1 and verse 2. Count it all joy. <laughs> That's the most ridiculous command like ever. Count it all joy. 
when you face trials of various kinds. For we know that the testing of our faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. What is the pathway to fullness? Steadfastness. What is steadfastness? It is standing under the pressure of the trial and serving God anyhow and worshiping God anyhow and doing what is right anyhow. How do we do that? You just count it all joy. When I know that whatever this is, it is literally going to be defeated and at the end of the battle is something that completes me. Like this is a joy. I think sometimes Christianity is the only sort of process of thought that pushes so hard against certain inconveniences. Like today, if you went into the gym and you went and sat down with a trainer, they're not going to look at you and say, I mean, you look great. Just keep doing whatever you're doing. It's fine. I mean, you know, a little, little pudgy on the sides, but I mean, you're all good. A little flabby here. You're great. They're not going to tell you that. They're going to say, yeah, we'll clean this up. We'll clean this up. Awesome. Fantastic. Let's get to work. You ready to work? Yeah. If you walk into a classroom and you don't know how to do algebra, they're not going to say, hey, that's fine. Simple math is enough. Two plus two, you got that? Ah. No, they're going to take you from what you don't know and they're going to test you so that they can teach you something, right? They're not hurting you. We're not talking about disease here. We're not talking about somebody killing your family members. We're just talking about something that's a little bit inconvenient that makes you stronger. That's all we're talking about. We're just talking about God saying, here, I've got something for you on top of that mountain, and I need you to walk from here to there. Oh, but it's real high. <laughs> Keep stepping. Yeah. But do I have to go that low to get up there? Do you see another way? Not really. Do you want the victory? I do. Well, then walk. But in Christian circles, like we, we, wanna, we don't want to ask people to do this. It's ridiculous. It's, it's literally become ridiculous where we, if we keep it up, we're just going to be a pool for the lazy. It's just going to be a bunch of lazy people all gathered around wanting to be told how awesome they are while their marriages fall apart. Nobody's going to want to be told, hey, why don't you treat each other better? Oh, I'm sorry. I just yell at myself when Jesus yells at me. I'm sorry. I'm not yelling at you talking to me. I want your kids to love you more. Spend more time with them. Find out their dreams. Find out what God has given them. Steward the gifts that are in them. Help them grow. You want them to want to come home more often? Add value to their life. Like, when we understand our opportunities, when we see the patterns, we can always do far better than we're doing. And isn't that what we want? I want, I want to do better. I want to be better. I want to be a greater reflection of Jesus himself. I want that for my life. So we see this moment where, again, the devil, and Jesus withstands the temptation again. And one of the things that I want us to see, there's a temptation here in this text that is lacking that was there last week, and it was there the week before. He said, if you are the son of God, by this time, Satan was finally convinced that Jesus knew who he was. If you aren't convinced yourself, you won't be convincing we have to understand who we are. We have to understand the callings that God has placed on our lives. If you're convinced about what you want to accomplish this year, then what I, tell, what I tell you is you will find yourself in a place where you will begin to convince others that that's what you're here to accomplish. But if you're not convinced yourself, you won't be very convincing. We see this moment in the book of Acts where there were people who needed help, like they were full of the devil. And so the disciples were literally casting the devil out of people. And so there was a group of uh, preacher's kids who saw people casting the devil out, and they thought, well, we want to do that. I, I guess we'll just do like kind of what they did, and we'll walk in, and we'll try that out. We'll just try it. You ever thought you're just going to try out God? Uh, we'll just try it out. So they walk up to this guy who's clearly full of the devil, 
You can see them everywhere, by the way. You need not look further than the road to find people full of the devil. And uh, so they walk up to this person, and this is what they say, Acts 19, 13. I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Does that sound very convincing? I mean, have you, have you read the book of Acts? Like, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. In the name of Jesus, come out of her. I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. You ever had something intellectually that you just hadn't lived out yet? You thought you knew it until you got in the middle of the scenario and then it was real life, it wasn't the classroom anymore? And you were tempted to say, I adjure you. You ever been there? It said, and the evil spirit said, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And then the person beat seven of them, stripped them naked, and kicked them out of the house. That, that's what happens to us when we aren't convinced of who we are. When we aren't convinced that we have a purpose on this planet and we are here to do it. We will continue to fail. But when we understand for what purpose God has anointed us and we move and we step in that purpose, we will see victory. But we have to be convinced first. You have to be convinced first. We have to be. In James chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, if you're going to ask for anything, let him ask in faith. With no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave that is tossed and turned by the sea. That person should not suppose that he will receive anything, for he is a double-minded person, unstable in all his ways. Now let me make sure we understand what double-mindedness is. It's not somebody who's just indecisive. Um, I... I sometimes can just stare at my closet and wonder, what am I going to wear today? This shirt, this shirt, that one. I don't, they're all blue, so you can't really pick the wrong color. But is it going to be hot? Is it not going to be hot? And I'll stand in there and I'll yell out for the weather. And Ab's like, it's going to be 80 tomorrow. And I'll wear like a T-shirt and then it's not 80. Because <laughs> it's clearly your wife's fault anytime you're not wearing something right the next day. Now, that's not being indecisive. You walk onto the car lot. Do I want a red car? Do I want a purple car? I don't know. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. In all your ways. We're not at, you don't, we don't have to ask God, should I get chicken or, sh or should I get fish today? You make 35,000 decisions in a day. You can't pray about every one of those. This, this idea that you have to pray about every single decision. No, no, no. You should have enough sense to know you enough, to be self-aware enough. Do you want a red one? Do you want a blue one? Get the blue one. God doesn't care if you have the red one or the blue one. What he does care is if you're happy. So sometimes you need to know yourself enough to know if you want the red one or the blue one. But that's not something you need to sit down and have an intercessory prayer meeting about. Yeah, but it says in all your ways, acknowledge him. Yes, in all your ways, not every single decision, your way. You are a double-minded person, unstable in all your ways. What that means is you are somebody who hasn't decided, am I going to serve God or am I going to serve the devil? Am I going to walk by the spirit or am I going to walk by the flesh? Am I going to obey God or am I going to disobey God? That is your ways. Your ways, how you actually live your life. You might make a mistake or two, but I think people should be able to follow us around and say, that person lives for God. Yes. And some people, they'll walk around and say, I'm not really sure about them. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. I'm not really sure about them. What is that person? Double-minded. They're unstable. What does that mean? That means they should not suppose that they will be, they will receive anything from God. And this is where we make the mistake in church because we see somebody who's double-minded and they're praying and we're like, well, we'll just pray with you that this is going to happen. Don't. Why? Because that person should not suppose they're going to receive anything from God. You know how you could help them is say, you know what? You need to make a choice here, life or death. I'm not praying anything until I know what your choice is. What, what, who are you going to live for? Oh, I'm going to live for God. Okay, well then let's pray. 
I'm tired of praying for people who are living on the fence and we know, we know they're not going to do it and then we pray anyhow and then we get discouraged when the prayer isn't answered. I'm, I'm the only person in this room, the only person in this room who's ever prayed for somebody that I thought, I don't think this is going to work out. And I prayed anyhow. I'm, in, I'm the only one. Even though I knew it wasn't going to work, I prayed anyhow and when it didn't work, I got discouraged. Why did I get discouraged? God didn't answer my prayer. <laughs> Let that person not suppose they will receive anything from God. Jesus knew who he was. His ways were sure. Now, I get it. He's Jesus. He's God. I understand that. But understand, when the word became flesh, he became flesh to demonstrate to us how we could live our life. Yes, he's Jesus. But how he lived demonstrated what is possible in the flesh. So when I recognize that, I've, I commit my life first. Before I commit to ask God for whatever I want, I commit first my ways to him. I commit my ways to him. Why? Because when the righteous cry for help, not, not the person who says, I love Jesus, who lives like the devil. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Jesus I know, Paul I recognize, but who are you? I never ever want that to be the conversation between me and a demon. First of all, I don't really want to talk to a demon, to be honest with you. But should he ever decide to talk back? That's not what I want to hear. Jesus, I know. Pastor Reggie, I recognize. Who are you? Walk around in my house. Jesus, I know. Abigail, I recognize. Who are you? I just live here. No, no, I want my, I want my ways to be sure. I want to know who I am in him. Jesus was not tempted the third time about who he was, for it was clear that he knew who he was. But then we see this moment where he says, the devil says, all this has been given to me and I can give it to you. Please understand there is a way to get to a certain reward that is not God's way to get to the reward. And we can make the mistake of seeing people who have something that it looks like that's the thing that we want and we want to mirror their pattern of getting to that thing that we want. And the problem is that isn't what we want. What we want is what God promises us that looks a lot like that, but the only way that it's what God promises you is when you take the pathway to get there that he set out. Amen. See, the pathway for Jesus to receive the power was not by bowing down to the enemy. The pathway was through the cross. And from the beginning, we see Satan laying traps to keep Jesus from going to the cross. He was promising him what God had already promised Jesus. Please, please see this. He says, I, look at all the kingdoms. I will give them to you. This is Satan telling Jesus, I'm going to give you all the kingdoms. He's saying, I have them and I can give them to you. Notice also that the kingdoms had been promised to Jesus. In Psalm chapter 2 and verse 7, it says, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage. Now, sometimes we'll get a TV preacher or two that'll kind of twist that one and make it sound like that's your prayer, that you pray for the nations, that some way all the people out there are out there to serve you. I've even heard it suggested that we're supposed to start businesses and let the world work for us. Why? So we can exploit them. And we, like, it's craziness sometimes. It's crazy. That psalm prophecy is about Jesus. You, you were not begotten. You were made. I just, I, but, but you understand this. Jesus is God from God. He is fully God. He's not made like we are. He said, you're my son. I've begotten you. That means God from God, the word became flesh. That's not us. We were created in his likeness. We were made in his likeness. That is not a scripture. That is not a text for us. Please realize we're the nations who've been promised to Jesus. We're the ones. We are his reward. I don't look around and look at the world and think the world is my reward. The world is Jesus' reward. 
I'm his reward. I'm going to be stacked in a multitude of nations on that day at the throne before the Lamb with every tribe, with every tongue, with every nation saying glory. I'm not standing next to Jesus receiving the praise. The nations aren't mine. That may not be a big deal to you. It's a huge deal to me because I think it's important that we recognize our place that we think not of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, but with sober thinking. Remember last last week? Be sober-minded, be watchful, because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. You can't deal with him if you're not sober-minded. If you don't understand where you are in that hierarchy, you're not sober-minded. If you're not sober-minded, you'll try and deal with the devil from a place of ego, and you'll never win. I have found places in my life where I let faith increase my ego instead of my trust in God. And I think I'm standing like firm, commanding the devil around, and I'm just some idiot preacher being arrogant because I think I'm more awesome than I am. I'm the only one in the room that's ever had that problem. Yeah, sometimes Sunday morning gets real. It's cold. I get frisky when it's cold. No, the the devil wants to take you on a shortcut to get you what's not yours to have that way. See, God wants to build your faith. He doesn't want to just give you a reward. He is the author and the completer of your faith. What he started, he's going to finish. That means if he wants you here and he wants you to take a step here, please don't just run to the reward. Just just take the step and become the person he wants you to be and become more of the person he wants you to be and more of the person he wants you to be and more and more and more. Because when you get there and you're the person that he's called you to be, then when you receive that reward, it will actually be a blessing to you instead of destruction. You know, when we receive the blessing of the Lord, it adds no sorrow. When we skip steps and jump straight to the reward, it'll be sorrow to us. He wanted him to skip the cross and go straight to the reward. Jesus said it like this in um, Matthew 23, 11. He said that the greatest among you must be your servant. For the one who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. There is a pathway of humility that leads to exaltation, but when we just step to be exalted, the end will be humility. We recognize the path. I don't want to just have what the promise God has made me. I want to be the person he's promised that I can be. I want to I wanna just submit to the process, man. I just want to follow. Like, what is the pattern of godliness? What does somebody who loves Jesus, how does he act in this scenario? How does he act in this scenario? I, I just want to keep being that person. See, this was a constant temptation. We read in Luke, it said, when Satan left Jesus, that he came back at a more opportune time. We see another moment where we're getting really, really close to the cross. A moment where... Jesus says, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Peter, but my father who is in heaven. Remember that moment? And then right after that moment, Jesus says, okay, guys, I have to go to the cross. And now Peter, who was just used by the spirit of God to declare the personhood of Jesus, who he was, now all of a sudden, this is what he turns around and says in uh, Matthew 16, 22. He says, far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. (laughs) Oh, Jesus heard that before. What did he say? Get behind me, Satan. Then he talked to Peter. And sometimes we miss this because we think the whole thing was to Satan. That whole conversation wasn't to Satan. When he said, get behind me, Satan, that's to Satan. But then he speaks to the heart of Peter. He says, you're a hindrance to me. You are setting your mind not on the things of God, but on the things of man. This is a a problem for all of us. 
We can all have that moment where we're setting our minds on the things of man rather than on the things of God. And when I set my mind on the things of man rather than on the things of God, I will speak not as the tongue of men of angels. I will not say words that are in alignment with the gospel of God. I will say things that are, oh, hey, man, you're, you're okay. Just live your own truth. That's encouraging, but is it godly encouragement? No. I'll say things that just seek to make people feel good about themselves. Maybe they don't need to feel good about sin. Maybe they, maybe they need to grovel in the uh, conviction of the Spirit of God right then. Maybe they don't need you telling them, oh, it's fine. Maybe it's not fine. Maybe you need to share a testimony of the time when you were going your own way and you turned and you found what? You found your faith again. Maybe that would be more encouraging than telling them they don't have to change. He said, you're focused on the things of man, not on the things of God. But here's what I love about this ending. What does he say? Be gone, Satan. And what happened? He left. He left. And here I want to end with this little story. Uh, last week, you know, I was bragging on being the middle child, being, being middle-aged, and having this great opportunity to see people who are older than I am just live in a way that seems to have greater victories than people who are younger than I am. And my daughter gets me home and she says, that's all great and I get all that, but what's the answer? <laughs> a good point. It's a great point. Be because if life itself is not testing us in ways that it used to test us, then how can we just deal with the devil with the same level of success that every generation has had, even though life itself is easier. And here's the bottom line. It's not that having a more complicated life prepares us to deal with the devil. It's just that having a more complicated life allowed people to deal better with what was complicated. When life is simple, now we just don't even want to deal with the inconvenience. But it doesn't mean that you can deal with the devil better. The only thing you need to have within you to deal with the devil is the word of God. That's all you need. So whether you had an easy life or a hard life, whether you rode the bus to school and were picked on all the way there, whether you walked uphill in the snow to get to school, or whether your mama put you in a nice car with the air conditioning and took you all the way to the canopy where you didn't even have to get wet on a rainy day. All of those scenarios have one weapon against the enemy. The same thing that Jesus had, the word of God. And so what you have to be aware of is what is the temptation? How is he coming at you today? And what do you have to speak against him? What do you have? And, and this is where I want to bring that old school right back to the center of this conversation. Because I can remember years and years and years ago, I can remember the way that generation used to deal with the devil. And I can look around and I can see how we're dealing with the devil. It doesn't, it doesn't look the same and it doesn't have the same result. We want to sit around and just cry about the devil. Oh, help me, Jesus. I'm so afflicted. Hear me, please. And on and on and on. Just grumbling and complaining. It's actually not a prayer, it's a complaint. But you know how they used to do it? This is how they used to do it. Some of you don't remember this. You're way too young. I remember this. They get those little ladies. What would they say? No, no, this. Oh, my. Oh, my. No, no, no. It was in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We have the victory. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Demons. Demons. Demons will have to flee. What is that? Why were they doing that? They were counting it all joy. They weren't staying around, whining and complaining. They said, devil, bring it. I'm just going to dance. I'm going to stomp right over top of you. And here's the thing, they walked away in victory. You'd see them the next week.
walking in victory. Why? Because they got it the week before. We come back in, we're still groveling. No, no, lift up. Lift up those hands that hang down. Clap your hands, all you people. I count it all joy. Why? Because in the end, I know. Be gone, Satan, in the name of Jesus. And Satan left him. If you want victory, follow the pattern of victory. And God will deliver you out of all your trials.